I was going through my phone and kept finding books by Dr. Ronald C. White, including um, Liberty and Justice for All. Um, that was a, a while back ago, Racial Reform and the Social Gospel. American Ulysses, A Life of Ulysses S. Grant, which was a bestseller. And um, we had him, he came and spoke several places in, in Philadelphia for that book. And his most recent book, Lincoln in Private, which he's speaking about tonight. Now, Dr. White is the author of numerous best selling books, including these ones I just mentioned. Um, he also is the author of A. Lincoln, a biography, which USA Today said if you read one book about Lincoln, make it A. Lincoln. Um, and his, his books have all reached bestseller, bestseller lists and um, are, he's considered one of the leading experts on Abraham Lincoln. So it is a real thrill to have you here tonight, Ron. We're sorry you couldn't be here in person, but look forward to getting you back this spring. Dr. White is a graduate of UCLA and Princeton Theological Seminary. He has a PhD in religion and history from Princeton University and has taught uh, at places as diverse as UCLA, Whitworth University, Colorado College, and Princeton Theological Seminary and is a senior fellow at the Trinity Forum. We are delighted to have you with us here tonight, Ron. If he had been able to be here in person, he, we would have been, um, been able to buy his book from Headhouse Books here at the Athenaeum. They are still at Headhouse Books, so we invite you to go over to the Headhouse Books or give them a call and purchase a copy of Lincoln in Private tonight or tomorrow or sometime soon. And Ron has very graciously offered to sign book plates. So if anybody would like a book plate for your book, just email us or call us with your name and your mailing address, and we'll get those to Ron and get the books, uh, book plates sent out to you. But tonight I invite you to join me in a warm welcome to Ronald White. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in, Beth and I have enjoyed a long friendship, so it's a special privilege to be invited by her to speak at the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. I'm delighted to be with you this evening, or this afternoon. I'm speaking from Pasadena, California. It was the spring of 1863, and Abraham Lincoln was facing a chorus of critics. The Union and Confederate forces were locked in a tumultuous civil war. The Northern public was becoming increasingly anxious about the force of this war. In the North, the larger and industrial might, the greater military power, people thought they would win the war in months, if not a couple of years. Now that the war got, went on until 1863, uh, they were calling it Mr. Lincoln's War. And so protest meetings began to take place across the country protesting the war. One was held in Albany, New York, and it was led by a group of people who called themselves Peace Democrats, or sometimes Copperheads. They wanted to return the nation, as they said, as it was, by which they meant slavery. Within the North, this movement arose. They sent the resolves, 10 resolves, to Lincoln. He sat down in his office to offer a response. As he did so, a young Iowa Congressman, James Wilson, entered his office. And as he watched Lincoln writing a response to the 10 Albany Resolves, he expressed his amazement that Lincoln could do this from scratch. And Lincoln said, oh no, and demurred and pointed over to his desk with an open desk drawer. He said, it's all in there. It's in disconnected thoughts, which I have jotted down from time to time on separate scraps of paper. The president explained that this was the way, quote, he kept his, my best thoughts on the subject. He told Wilson, I never want one of those ideas to escape me. Well, Lincoln did not want his best ideas to escape him, but they have escaped us. Over his lifetime, Lincoln wrote many, many, many private notes. He never thought we would be talking about him this evening in Philadelphia. He never dated them, never titled them, never signed them. When I started to write this book, having encountered some of these notes previously, 
I contacted the new Lincoln Legal Lincoln Papers project in Springfield and asked, well, how many notes are there? How many do you have? And they said, well, we have 111 of notes that have survived. I think Lincoln wrote hundreds more. We might get into the question of why did not more survive? So for the first time ever, all 111 notes are published as the appendix to the book, Lincoln in Private. Sometimes we call these notes fragments. What's that mean? Well, they're fragmentary. It's like you or me would be writing something down, the telephone rings, the email rings, somebody knocks on the door, and Lincoln doesn't finish the notes. He stops in the middle of a word. He doesn't even put a period at the end of a sentence. So I made the difficult decision of deciding to focus on 12 of these notes in 10 chapters. And I decided to do this by lifting up what I thought were a variety of aspects of Lincoln. So I'm titling the chapter something like the lyrical Lincoln, the humble Lincoln, the fiery Lincoln, the defeated Lincoln, the Republican Lincoln, the outraged Lincoln. We may not get to all of them in my presentation, but I welcome you, those of you who have read the book, to ensure in your questions or comments to ask me questions about it. Let me begin with what I call the lyrical Lincoln. Uh, this is the first fragment that we have in the book. It's uh, it comes about by his trip to Niagara Falls in 1848. He was in the middle of his first and only term in the United States Congress. And on his way home, he decided to stop at Niagara Falls. He writes this remarkable note and doesn't date it, but we can try to figure out the date because we know of the dates of that journey from Washington to Boston, where he campaigned for Zachary Taylor, the presidential candidate that year of the Whig Party, to his trip home to Springfield. Niagara Falls, by what mysterious power is it that millions and millions are drawn from all parts of the world to gaze upon Niagara Falls? Lincoln goes on and on, and then he concludes, I'm not going to read the whole note, let me just read his concluding sentences. But still there is more. It calls up the indefinite past, when Columbus first sought this continent, when Christ suffered on the cross, when Moses led Israel through the Red Sea, nay, even when Adam first came from the hand of his maker. Then as now, Niagara was roaring here. The eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours do now, contemporary with a whole race of men and older than the first man, Niagara is strong and fresh today as 10,000 years ago. The mammoth and the mastodon now so long dead that fragments of their monstrous bones alone testify that had they ever lived, they gazed on Niagara. And then this final sentence, in that long, long time, never still for a single moment, never dried, never froze, never slept, never rested, comma. He doesn't end the sentence. I think he was interrupted by his wife or his children and he left it right there. But what's the point of writing a book on Lincoln in private? I'm suggesting, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with Lincoln, you've read various biographies of Lincoln, that here we be, are able to see a side or sides of Lincoln that we may not see in the public Lincoln, the Lincoln of the first inaugural address or the Emancipation Proclamation or the second inaugural address. So I want to lift up these different sides of Lincoln. So Lincoln continues home to Springfield and there he talks with his law partner, William Herndon. Now Herndon, after Lincoln's death, who having been the law partner says, I know Lincoln more than anyone. But this is what Herndon says. He had just been to Niagara himself. Lincoln had no eye for the magnificence and grandeur of the scene, for the rapids, the mists, the angry waters and the roar of the whirlpool. This Lincoln, according to Herndon, was heedless of beauty or awe. 
people obviously earned them have never read Lincoln's fragment on Niagara. So he, like others, did not see this side. Let's refresh our memories of the biography of Lincoln. He was born in 1809 in Kentucky. At age nine, moved with his family, age seven, moved with his family to southern Indiana and then to Illinois. He grew up in what was called then the Second Great Awakening. His parents attended Baptist churches. Lincoln was turned off by the emotionalism of those church experiences and decided that for the rest of his life, he would become a very rational, thoughtful person, which he did become. So this side of Lincoln, this lyrical Lincoln, I think is really important. Now, Tess has put up on the screen for us another fragment that I think is extremely important. Lincoln served one term in Congress, 1847 to 1849, and then having taken a very unpopular stand against the war with Mexico, criticizing President James Polk, demanding to say, for Polk to say the spot on which the Mexicans invaded America, where Lincoln was quite convinced that it was exactly the opposite. America had invaded Mexico. He returns home and his friends say, well, thank you very much, Mr. Lincoln. We're not going to elect you to another term in office. You've taken a stand against the president of the United States. So for five years, he served full time as a lawyer. And then when the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed, 1854, by Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas, Lincoln came roaring out of his law practice into politics. For the Kansas-Nebraska Act opened the possibility that slavery could extend to the West, into the Western territories. And Lincoln was just terrified by this possibility. So what he does in many of the fragments is write about slavery. He doesn't, this surprised me, he doesn't include these fragments or notes in any of his public speeches, I think they are his wrist for speaking. It's the way he thinks to himself how to get his mind wrapped around this difficult topic of slavery. So let's look at this one. You can read Lincoln's handwriting. It's pretty clear. Uh, people in the 19th century practice their handwriting. If A can prove, however conclusively, that he may have write in slave B, why may not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may enslave A? Oh, you say A is white and B is black. It is color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Take care. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with a fairer skin than your own. You do not mean color exactly. You mean, therefore, you mean whites are intellectually the superiors to black. Take care again. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. Notice how Lincoln underlines the key words in this fragment. He does so, we know, in his public speeches in the second inaugural, for example, but he also does in these notes to himself. He never expected us to ever see them. But say you, it's a question of interest. And if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another very well. And if he can make it his interest, he has the right to enslave you. I'm continually amazed by the reality that Lincoln had but one year of formal education. Boys received education in January and February when it was too cold to work on the farms with their fathers and families hired itinerant teachers who came through to teach their children. We think he did this for five or possibly six Januaries and February, a total of at the most one year of formal education. Well, are there other aspects of the private Lincoln that might surprise us? Uh, let's talk about one more, more than one more, but let's talk about the next one. In 1855, Lincoln ran for the United States Senate. In the 19th century, up until the early 20th century, senators were elected by state legislatures. And so 
on the first seven ballots, Lincoln was in the lead, only a few votes shy of gaining the majority needed to be elected. But by the end of the seventh ballot, he realized that he could not win. He was running on an anti-Kansas Nebraska platform against the extension of slavery. Now at the end of the seventh ballot, another Republican who was for the extension of slavery looked like he might become the victor. And so Lincoln, to the surprise of his own backers, pulled his candidacy and put his chips behind a Democrat who was also against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He lost the election. He was quite magnanimous in public about it. It was okay. We know that Lincoln's highest aspiration in life was to become a United States Senator. He never dreamed of becoming the United States President. But privately, unknown to anyone, he wrote and then a note. I'll read it for you. 22 years ago, we can date this note because he uses these words 22 years ago. Stephen Douglas and I first became acquainted. We were both young then, he a trifle younger than I. Even then we were both ambitious, I perhaps quite as much as he. With me, the race of ambition has been a failure. With him, it has been one of splendid success. His name fills the nation and is not unknown in foreign lands. With me, the race of ambition has been a failure, a flat failure. Amazing. In less than four years, Lincoln will be elected president of the United States. There is no place in the public record where Lincoln admits his own failure. But here in a note he wrote only for himself, he gives vent to his feelings, his deep feelings of being a failure. Tess, let's put up the next note and talk about it. It's very, very brief. In after Lincoln's death, the sort of tragic story of Mary Lincoln goes forward. Lots of people are critical of Mary Lincoln. I'm not so critical. I'm wanting to be more understanding. She lost her first son, Eddie, in 1850 when he was three and a half. She lost a second son, Willie, in 1862 when she was in the White House. He was age 11. She may have been holding her husband's hand at Ford's Theater when he was assassinated. She would then, a few years later, lose a third son, Tad. And so by 1875, probably struggling with herself, perhaps with mental illness, she was in a Chicago courtroom, prosecuted, and the 12-man male jury judged her guilty, and she was assigned to a, what they then called an insane asylum in Bellevue, Illinois. She struggled there for some weeks in, before a remarkable woman, a, one of the first women lawyers of, of, of the nation really stepped forward to try to see what she could do, Myra Bradwell. And Myra Bradwell and her husband worked diligently to get Mary Lincoln released from the asylum and released from having her own son be in charge of her finances. In gratitude, she gave Myra Bradwell several things. A number of things were gifts that Lincoln had been given by foreign rulers. But she also gave her this remarkable note. It's a mystery as to how she kept possession of it. You note that it has no date, it has no title. How do we know these are Lincoln notes, by the way? Well, we know them by Lincoln's distinctive handwriting. Again, I asked the folks in Springfield about Lincoln's handwriting, and one of the editors told me that Lincoln, perhaps like us, as he got older, his handwriting got smaller and got rounder. This is a remarkable note, very, very brief. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this, to the extent of the difference is no democracy. Lincoln in his engagement with slavery had first come to the idea that slavery was evil and awful for African-Americans. 
As a 19 year old, he had taken a load of produce down from Indiana to New Orleans. And there he saw standing on one side was a platform of men. On the other side was a platform of women and children, all enslaved. Marriage was not recognized among slaves. And this just struck him to the core. But the more he engaged slavery, the more he realized that slavery was also not good for the master, not good for white people. Notice one thing about this definition. I've learned this from, uh, from Douglas Wilson, the wonderful Lincoln scholar at Knox College. Notice Lincoln's use of what Wilson calls the negative, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. An interesting way to make a point, this is no. This is not my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from the that, from this, to the extent of the difference is no democracy. If you go back this evening and reread the Gettysburg Address, you will see how Lincoln uses this negative again and again. Well, as I say, there's twelve fragments that I talk about, but let's talk about just one more before we open this up to your comments and questions. So Tess, if we could put up the meditation on the divine will. Now I'm calling this the meditation on the divine will. Why am I doing that? I thought I was supposed to have said there are no titles. Well, there are no titles, but John Hay, one of Lincoln's two young secretaries, found this in Lincoln's desk drawer after the assassination. He kept it for himself, began to use it in some lectures he gave in the early 1870s, and then it was given to his school, Brown University, and now there is the John Hay Library at Brown University. In the first Lincoln book I wrote, Lincoln's Greatest Speech, the Second Inaugural, I traveled to Brown to hold this fragment in my hand. I'm not sure they'd let you hold it in your hand today, but they did at that time. It's on a piece of white paper with blue lines. One of the beauties of this book to which I give credit to my publisher, Random House, is you will notice if you decide to purchase it or if you already have it, some of the fragments are printed in full color. So you can get a real sense of the way they looked in the original. Lincoln comes to Washington as the nation's 16th president. As I suggested at the beginning, the war is not going well. In the end, at August 1862, the North suffers another disastrous defeat, the defeat of what was called the Second Battle of Manassas or Second Battle of Bull Run. The North and the South described these battles with different titles. Lincoln convened an emergency cabinet meeting. Fortunately for us, three of his cabinet secretaries kept diaries. One of them, the attorney general from Missouri, wrote in his diary that Lincoln is filled, he said, with the bitterest of anguish, felt almost ready to hang himself. And then we believe there's no date and there's differing opinions as to the date, but I'm going to say the date was that afternoon, September 2nd, 1862. Listen to what Lincoln says. You can read in his clear handwriting. The will of God prevails. In great contests, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be and one must be wrong. Notice the underline. You cannot be for, God cannot be for or against the same thing at the same time. This is the logical Lincoln speaking. And then this really profound sentence, in the present civil war, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. People were coming to Lincoln, politicians and ministers to say, God is on our side, God is on our side. But he knew they were coming to Jefferson Davis and saying the very same thing, God is on our side. But he suggests in the present civil war, it's quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. And yet the human instrumentalities working just as they do are of the best adaptation to affect his purpose. I'm almost ready to say 
this is probably true that God wills this contest and wills that it shall not end yet by his mere quiet power. Lincoln did not like the noisy God he encountered as a boy by his mere quiet power on the minds of the now contestants. He could have either saved or destroyed, notice the underlines, saved or destroyed the union without a human contest. And having begun, he could give the final victory to either side any day. You're not suggesting, Mr. Lincoln, are you, that he could give the final victory to the Confederacy? Well, you certainly wouldn't want to say that in public. And of course, he did not. Yet the contest proceeds. Now, in that remarkable second inaugural address, March 4, 1865, to the surprise of almost everyone in just 701 words, Lincoln mentions God 14 times, quotes the Bible four times, invokes prayer three times. No one, no one that day knew that he had written two and a half years before this meditation on the divine will. But in the chapter in Lincoln in private, I in one place put up parallel passages side by side to show what I believe is that the meditation is actually the foundation, the foundation document of the second inaugural address. It's more philosophical. It's more theological. It doesn't have the flesh and blood of the second inaugural, but I think it's the foundation. Well, let me conclude with this story. I really enjoy speaking to high school students. It's wonderful when young people say to me that they are enjoying Lincoln, or maybe they're enjoying a book I've written on Lincoln. I've spoken to 11th graders from Massachusetts to Honolulu. And I like to talk about these fragments. And so at the end of my presentation, I will say to these high school students, how long do you think it took Lincoln to write these fragments? And invariably, they will answer three minutes four minutes, five minutes, and I say, how about an hour <laughs> or two? And I said that at one school here in Pasadena, California, Poly High School, and the faculty in the back were all applauding. I said, you know, it takes time to think deeply why this, all of us are so addicted to our screens today. Are we willing to take the time to think deeply about the most important issues of our lives. Lincoln took the time. He told his secretaries, I don't want any visitors. And he wrote these notes to himself. We are so fortunate in this tumultuous time in which we live, I think not only to have available to us the public Lincoln, the inaugural address, the Emancipation Proclamation, but the private Lincoln. I commend him too. He is worth learning about, and hopefully, perhaps, following his example in our own time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. I invite you all to put your questions. It can be related to this book, to any of his, his work, his biography of Lincoln, uh, Lincoln's second inaugural, um, Lincoln's writing, Lincoln's thinking, how it's changed over time. I invite you to um, put your questions in the Q&A or chat. And while we're waiting for those questions to come up, one of the things I love about this book, Ron, it's a beautiful book. As you, as you said, every single one of these letters is in color, is, in, is photographed um, and included in the book. Um, I've got that fake background, so it's hard to see. You also have other images in here and you have an appendix at the end in which you've transcribed every single one of his fragments. Um, so we're waiting for questions from people. I, I'd love to hear a little bit from you on how you see the work of an historian like you, not just compiling the grand story, but creating books like this that allow each of us to do our own learning. Um, thank you, Beth. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I have lots of people say to me, and with appreciation, I'm sure this book took a lot of research. But one day, a couple of years ago, I was at the Huntington Library in San Marino and visiting at that time was the wonderful English, actually Welsh historian, Richard Carwardine. 
from Oxford, who has written a great biography of Lincoln. And we were to have lunch together. And as he came out of Huntington that morning, he said, boy, I have done a lot of research today. And then he paused and he said, and now I need to think about what it means. <laughs> so it's one thing to do the research. It's another thing to think about what it means. And what it means changes over time as we live in a different time today than 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 60 years ago. And so I have been wrestling with these fragments for a long time. And to try to put together, what does this mean about the private Lincoln? Is there something here that perhaps we have not seen clearly, we've not had in focus before? And that became the genesis of this. I had worked on one or two or three or four of these. Someone asked me recently, if I were rewriting my biography, how might I do it? I said, well, I'd have to rewrite it because I did not include in the biography, I think now looking backwards, as much about the fragments as I would now do today. I've always been fascinated with diaries. I was impressed when John Meacham wrote his biography of George H.W. Bush, and he said that he could only write it when George and Barbara allowed him to look at their diaries. I've been impressed with Ulysses S. Grant's personal memoirs, but this is different than a diary, and it's different than a memoir, and it's very distinctive, and I think it really asked us to take this more seriously. So, so pulling on that, what do you feel like you learned about Lincoln that shifts your view of him in any way? Well, I, I, I don't think I really fully understood Lincoln's thought process. For example, after the uh, dr terrible Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court, which ruled that Dred Scott as an African-American was not a person and therefore could not achieve the rights of a person in the United States. Lincoln was furious about this, deeply angry. So today, if something like happened, we'd have him interviewed, wouldn't we, on some cable news channel. Lincoln did not speak for three months. He took his time. I say he held his fire. He went to law library in Springfield. He gathered his thoughts, and finally, after three months, as angry as he was, he knew he wasn't prepared to really speak cogently and articulately about this. That's a lesson. We speak too quickly. Do we ever edit our emails? Do we ever say, oh, well, I don't think I should send that one because I know I'm angry at the moment with that person? No, I think we just sort of get it out there. And I think Lincoln is a great lesson for how he did not do that. Well, Charlene is wondering if Lincoln, besides these, uh, these fragments that you found, did he keep a more organized diary? Charlene, thank you. I wish he had kept an organized diary, but there is no example, no evidence that he did. Kind of a, almost a corollary to that is, would he have written his memoirs if he had lived? Well, we don't know the answer to that, but unfortunately he did not live. And so he died at barely age 56. And he did not give us the benefit of his memoirs. So this is the closest thing we have, I think, Charlene, to the kind of interior Lincoln. Yeah, I loved as you were working on the book, as you sort of described it to me as, you know, Lincoln's closest yeah. thing we had to Lincoln's diary, um, which is fascinating. So John and or Carolyn, one of the two, is asking... Uh, you've been speaking to 11th graders for some time. Has their understanding of Lincoln and his place in history changed over time? And if so, how? And then further, one of these two part, three part questions. <laughs> further, how does their grasp of Lincoln the man now compare with that of students when you first started speaking with them about him? Thank you, John and Carolyn. Uh, we have to remember that and I think this is very important as we have this tumultuous debate about statues and names of people on buildings, that Lincoln is a 19th century person. He can't help us with climate change. He can't tell an American president what to do in Iraq or Afghanistan. He has attitudes of a 19th century person. But I think he's one of those very, very few people whose words and example can speak across time with malice toward none, 
with charity for all. I read the diaries and the, and the letters of the people who attended that second inaugural on March 4, 1865. They were angry. Our nation is angry today. Well, why were they angry? Probably every person there had lost a father, husband, son, brother. And the last thing they expected Lincoln to say was, let's forgive. In fact, the parade in that day was before the inauguration, and there was a a float that was a kind of a press of one of, the, one of the city newspapers. And the editorial said, this is the day for Lincoln to crow a bit. Look at all the criticism he's achieved all these four years. He ought to crow a bit. He didn't crow at all. In fact, I say Lincoln disappears in the second inaugural. He uses not one, he uses but two personal pronouns, none in the Gettysburg Address. Can you imagine a modern politician not using personal pronouns? He is speaking and pointing beyond himself to the great values. So in many ways, I would say my estimation of Lincoln has grown. His stature has grown. And I've discovered in my ability to speak about Lincoln in seven different countries beyond the United States of the incredible appreciation of Lincoln in other countries. Interesting. Um, so Vic as, is wondering if Lincoln had any known spiritual practice and if he shared deeply with his confidants, if there's any record of that. That's a wonderful question, Vic. Thank you for that. We have two very specific examples. Uh, uh, after the death of Willie in April, April in 1862, a nurse came in to be really with Mary Lincoln, who was going through a terrible, terrible time. Elizabeth Pomeroy was her name. And so she would sit with the Lincolns, or sometimes just with him at lunch. And she wrote in her memoir that it was his practice to take out the Bible, an old Bible, lined Bible, weathered Bible, and often read the Bible or actually say portions of the Bible from memory. He could say whole, and again, a practice of people in the 19th century, he could say whole psalms from memory. Another person who was in the White House, uh, early on in the White House, the Lincolns became acquainted with a family that had several boys who played with the Lincoln boys, but there was also an older girl, the daughter was older, and she wrote a book later on called Tad Lincoln's Father. And she has the very same evidence that when she was in the White House, she noticed how Lincoln's practice, to use the word, your word, was to read the Bible in a regular way. So we know that it's a smart thing today in inaugural addresses for every modern president to quote the Bible, you got to do it. But Lincoln wasn't just quoting the Bible. This was a part of his daily spiritual practice. And did he have close confidants that, that, that you know of? Well, the, the, the missing person in the Lincoln story is his minister at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. Phineas Densmore Gurley was the pastor. He was number one in his class at Princeton Seminary. And Lincoln, more than he ever had in the early part, in the rest of his life, began to attend New York Avenue on a regular basis. And we have in the Presbyterian Historical Society, of which you know well, Beth, we have Phineas Densmore Gurley's sermons. So we know what he was preaching. But most prominently, he preached the sermon at the memorial service for Willie Lincoln. And in that sermon, he says to Lincoln, I ask you to trust in biblical providence. Well, Lincoln, who had rebelled against his parents' religion, many children, grandchildren, ourselves have done that. He then comes back, but not to that emotional faith he finds in the Presbyterian tradition, both in Springfield and Washington, a more thoughtful, more rational faith. So I think Gurley is really his kind of confidant, or we might even call him his spiritual mentor. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about Lincoln's relationship with Frederick Douglass and the influence that Douglass had on Lincoln. That's a very good question. Thank you for asking. 
That question has also been part of the recent turmoil surrounding Lincoln. For some of you will know that the Freedmen's Memorial was built and dedicated in 1876. Frederick Douglass spoke at the memorial. Ulysses S. Grant unveiled the memorial. And all of the money for the memorial was given by freed slaves. But to our eyes in the 21st century, we are taken aback when we view the memorial because it shows Lincoln standing, the emancipator, and two slaves kneeling, approaching him. And this seems very much out of character. So some people have seized upon Douglas and have quoted part, part of his speech in which he says Lincoln was the white man's president. And they have used this to criticize Lincoln and used these words to criticize the monument, but they did not quote all of the speech. For later in the speech, Douglas goes on to say, but as the white man's president, he was speedy, he was fast, he was racing forward, and he commends Lincoln for what he did for the emancipation of American, African Americans. I'm really bothered, I have to say at times, by how we take one part of a speech, this particular speech, and don't look at the whole of it. Douglas is saying two different things here about Lincoln, both of which we need to hear. So you you include in your in your book um, a speech that he was preparing to give in the South. Yes. And they did not. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about that. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Lincoln, as he prepared to travel to Washington on a 13-day inaugural trip, uh, we know quite a bit about that. A recent book called Lincoln on the Verge is a wonderful book telling us that story. But what we've missed is that he had another speech to prepare in addition to the 102 comments, they mostly were not speeches, that he gave all along the way. What's interesting about this is that there was, believe it or not, an attempt to disrupt the counting of the electoral votes. And William Seward was very worried that parallel to January 6th, Confederates would come and try to disrupt the counting of the votes. And he said to Lincoln, forget your trip, come ahead secretly, we got to be here, we can't let this be disrupted. But Lincoln said, well, I appreciate that you're concerned, but I want to take this trip because I want to be in contact with all these people. I think this can help put together their loyalty to the Union. But what we've missed in this trip, almost universally missed, Harold Holzer, great Lincoln author has not missed it, is that Lincoln prepared yet another speech. He hoped to give it in Kentucky. We find it pasted on the back of a first draft of his first inaugural. We know the first inaugural was printed privately in Springfield. So we know that he prepared the speech in Springfield. He didn't prepare it on the train. And now we have not the full speech, but let me read just a part of it. I am grateful for the opportunity your invitation affords me. We wish we knew who invited you. We don't know which individual or which organization to appear before an audience of my native state. During the present winter, it has been greatly pressed upon me by many patriotic citizens, Kentuckians among them, notice how he's including them as patriotic citizens, that I could in my position by a word restore peace to the country. But what word? Now we must remember that Lincoln did not campaign in 1860. He believed that everything you needed to know about him had already been said in his printed speeches. So now, although he's affirming the Kentuckians, he's challenging the idea that somehow there's some new word that he's going to speak. So let me just read then the last few sentences. I thought such refusal was demanded by the view that if when a chief magistrate is constitutionally elected himself, he cannot be inaugurated till he betrays those who elected him by breaking his pledges and surrendering to those who tried and failed to defeat him at the polls. This government of all popular government is already therefore at an end. Demands for such surrender once recognized are without limit 
as to the nature, extent, and repetition. They break the only bond of faith between public and public, public and public servant, and they distinctly set the minority over the majority. And in the middle of the speech, he says, if you want to change things, you can do so in the next election. <laughs> so this is remarkable. And it's one of those, again, fragments that is not known. And I thought it needed to be known. Yeah, I'm glad you, that was just a great chapter in bringing that out. So, you know, it matters for our times today too, to hear him saying those. Um, Vic has another question, wondering how Lincoln coped with the great losses of his sons. Thank you, Vic, for that question. What's really interesting is that there is in these 111 notes, nothing about Mary, nothing about his children. Now, why? In the 19th century, people burned letters between husband and wife. This was private. We know that when the Lincolns got ready to take that train to Washington, Mary Lincoln went out in the back alley behind their home and did what she called her burn pile, her burn pile. She burned all kinds of documents, which I suspect were letters between she and her husband. There's only two or three letters that have survived between Abraham and Mary. So did Lincoln burn some of the things that he had written? He very well might have, even though I said earlier, he did not expect us ever to read these documents these fragments are basically mostly about politics, about slavery, about the Civil War, about appointments into office when he's president. To our disappointment, perhaps, there is nothing in here about his children or his wife. It's interesting. Well, thank you. I look, I'm not seeing any more questions. We have a kind of a quiet group tonight. I think we've all gotten out of habit with our, <laughs> with our virtual programs. <laughs> we're, we're all talked out these days, but um, I know everybody has been, has been listening and um, this has just been a wonderful talk and I encourage everyone to get a copy of this book. Anybody you know who loves Lincoln, who loves great history, who cares about politics in our nation. I encourage you to, to get this book the way it's written. Um, you know, I take the train to and from work and that's my time to read. And um, it's, it's, it's a book that you can read in small, small sections if you just have a little time. And Ron, you also do the audio for the yes, audio version. Yes, this was quite right? wonderful and surprising to me in the past when I sort of put, I do the audio. Oh, no, no, no. These are done by what I call British actors. So this time I kind of gingerly said, well, would you consider, oh, so the British actor who was my director went on YouTube and listened to me for three or four speeches. I think you can do it. So this was a four day experience, really remarkable. And then when we thought we were finished, they sent the whole thing to New York and they came back with 70 different discrete sentences that they wanted me to say over again. So I said, I think I know a lot about Lincoln, and I think I know the way maybe he would have said these words, not to dismiss the narrators of A. Lincoln or American Ulysses, but it was a great experience to do that. Yeah. Very fun. So, so there you go. If you want to get the book as an audio book, you are welcome to do that, too. And just let us know your, if you're planning on buying a book from Hidden House Books or from somewhere else, but encourage you to support our local, local bookseller. Um, just let us know and we'll let Ron know and um, he'll get book, we'll get book plates out to you. And Dick is, is giving his, his uh, deep regard and thanks to you, Ron, for this talk. Thank you very and much. Thank you. Dick and Charlene, uh, thanking you. It's fun, all the things that come at the end. Um, and I look forward to seeing you out here this spring or next time. Well, we hope, to do, is this a, in, we hope yes. we can do this in person it's next in person. week. We do. Otherwise, I'll come say hi to you when you... Uh, when you when I get out there to see my my parents too. Oh, yeah, Judy Allison also said didn't have a question, but a great presentation and she learned a lot. That's always the goal. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Beth, and thank you, Tess. Thank you, thank and everybody every for showing up. And um, we have our next program is on Wednesday night. It is in person. It is um, a new novel. 
by Christine Pride and Joe Piazza. We are not like them. A novel. And we'll be in conversation with Jennifer Weiner. Weiner, Weiner, how do you say her last name? This is awful. Um, I read her books. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be their moderator. This is a fascinating book, kind of alternates a story between uh, a, a white woman and an African American woman, her best friends in Philadelphia, and um, kind of relating to some of the, the challenges we've had the last couple of years of a police officer uh, kills someone in the line of duty and, and the different feelings and emotions that come up with that. It's a fantastic book, should be a great conversation. I invite you, please join us on Wednesday evening here in person. Next Wednesday evening, Sandy Eisenstadt talking about modern spaces of electric light. It's an event co-sponsored by the Society of Architectural Historians. So a few fun things coming up. Um, check our website for more events and our weekly e-newsletter. And uh, join me in thanking, thanking Ron for joining us tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, we're getting a few more. Um, when Jordan, thanking you for your talk. Um, the phone number, um, uh, Nicholas, thank you. Thanks you for the enlightening perspective. Wonderful. Grateful to everybody for showing up. So you still have, it's still early. It's not even your dinner time yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> Get your shorts back on. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let me see. Wait, one more Q and A. Let me see. That was from Judy. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much, Joan. <laughs> and we'll see you again. Yeah. And uh, DSA Lusky, thank you so much. So I guess for people to know, Ron will be here speaking at the Union League April 27th, 25th, April 25th for Ulysses Grant, Grant's uh, 200th birthday. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope to get him here at the Athenaeum to do something. So it'll be very fun. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ron. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I don't get to take you out for, for a dinner now. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Next time. Take care. All right. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye.